that you'll need for today's session. Uh, scratch piece of paper, it can be big, it, it can be small, it doesn't matter. Uh, scratch piece of paper and a power cord of some kind. If you've got a power cord plugged into your computer right now, that'll be fine. Uh, a power cord of some kind and a piece of paper. You'll need some supplies for today's event. Thank you to the 429 of you who have already joined us. If you are just joining us, uh, take a moment, grab some supplies for today. You're gonna need a scratch piece of paper, power cord of some kind would be super, super helpful. Thank you for the 445 of you who are in. If you are just joining us, scratch piece of paper, power cord of some kind, uh, you'll discover why here momentarily. Hooray for open loops, right? <laughs> Welcome everybody. Thank you to the 461 of you who are here. If you're just joining us, grab yourself a power cord, piece of paper, uh, scratch piece of paper of any size or shape uh, for what comes next. You will need it. <laughs> and welcome to Middletown educators and to our guest. We are very excited to have Weston Kishnick back with us today. So thank you. We're happy that you're here and looking forward to your learning. And I just want to share with you, Wes, that um, from your sessions, we've already seen um, teachers implementing some of the strategies that you've shared, some of the best practices, and also leaders that um, people are already sharing those things. So it's really been powerful. These sessions have really helped us to rethink our practice and what we're doing with students, and also just what we do as um, educators. You know, it's been very teacher friendly, and we just want to thank you because we've certainly heard um, our um, educators and leaders refer to the, um, session, to the strategies you've taught, and it's been helpful, so thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Meg. I really appreciate it. Um, as people are popping in, do me a favor. If you have a scratch piece of paper and if you have a charging cord of some kind, do me a favor. Let me know that you have one by just typing yes into the chat window. Uh, it will A, let me know that you are here. B, let me know that you have the supplies. Excellent. I'm seeing all kinds of yes, yes, yes. Excellent. Nice. Super. Looks like everyone has what they need. Maggie, are we ready to rock and roll? I believe, I see that we have 502 participants, 503. I believe we are ready to start. Awesome. Thank you to the 500 of you who are in here, who are telling me I have my supplies. I see you there, Amanda. Uh, thanks for having your supplies, your scratch piece of paper, your charging cord of some kind. Uh, let's get into it today, uh, shall we, my friend? Um, <laughs> Steven says, yeah. I'll need to go to CVS and get some. Steven, don't leave now. Don't leave now. If you don't have your supplies, it's absolutely fine. Damien, what did I tell you about yeppers? Uh, I hope you're an Office fan so that you get that joke. And if not, uh, there you go. If you don't have a power cord, Patrick, it's just fine. Uh, it, let's jump into it. Uh, Mike, I, I saw you there. Uh, I like that you liked my yeppers comment. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Clearly an Office fan. Um, so let's get into it. Here's the first thing I'd like you to do before we get started. Before we get started, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like you to think about something you value. Uh, not just something, I would like you to think about and get this, get this into your head. You're not gonna need to do anything with it just yet. You're not gonna need to type it into the chat window. I just want you to think about what your answer to the following question is going to be. Uh, if I were to ask you, what is the thing in life that you value most? I want you to think about it. Don't type it into the chat window. You don't need to tell anyone around you. You don't need to share it with anyone in your house. I just want you to think, what's your answer to the question, what is the thing in life that you value most? And if I were to ask you to distill that down to one word, a single word, again, you don't need to type your word into the chat window, do not. Just think about it. What is the thing in life that you value most? And if I were to ask you to answer that question in a single word, think about what your answer would be. And as you think about what, the, what your answer would be, go ahead and move that single word from the front of your brain, uh, not too far to the back, hold on to it. You're gonna need it here momentarily. Here's what I'd like you to do. Uh, I would like you to take your scratch piece of paper and uh, I'm gonna ask you to write uh, some simple responses on this sheet of scratch paper. I'm gonna do it along with you. I would never ask you to do a thing that I'm not willing to do myself. Uh, now, I wanna say this. I'm gonna ask you to write down responses to some questions and some prompts that I have. Let me uh, pause for just a moment and just preface our time with this. 
there might be a point during this activity where some of you out there are going to potentially want to be mad at me. And I'm going to ask you to resist that temptation, please. Resist the temptation. Um, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. First things first, somewhere on a scratch piece of paper, again, it doesn't have to be big or small, it doesn't matter. Somewhere on this scratch piece of paper, uh, I would like you to write down your full name, please, right? So write down your first name, your middle name. If you're like my son and you have two middle names, write those down, your given name. First name, middle name, multiple names, last name. Uh, if you are the Cosmo Kramer of the group out there and nobody knows your actual first name, I'd like you to write that down, please. Um, if you are too young to even get that Cosmo Kramer joke and never saw Seinfeld, know that it hurts my heart. It's okay. I will not hold it against you. Write down your full name, first thing. Uh, underneath that, write down your age. Write down your age, if you please. Again, some of you are writing down that age. Uh, write down your current age, not the age that you tell people you are. Write down your actual age. Good. And then uh, know that it's about to get a little bit worse. Underneath that, I would like you to write down your height and weight. Now, this is, this is the moment that I warned some of you about, where you, where you are going to want to be mad at me. Write down your actual height, your actual weight. Uh, I had a woman ask me in a session one time, she said, can I write down the weight that's on my driver's license? And my, and my response was, I would like you to write down your current weight. So go ahead and jot that down. And I will do the same, my current weight. Excellent. Underneath that, <laughs> Shannon says pre-quarantine or post. Shannon, post-quarantine weight. Current weight right now, yes. If you're anything like me, uh, those, those quarantinis have, have put on some pounds. I, I'm, I'm with you. Um, underneath that, jot down a quick synopsis of your most embarrassing moment. So think about it. If you're anything like me, chances are you have lots of them. Uh, uh, it, you, choose one. Choose one. Quick synopsis of your most embarrassing moment. Uh, seriously, just uh, really, really brief. Um, English language arts teachers out there, this does not have to be the novelization of your most embarrassing moment. It just needs to be a quick synopsis of your most embarrassing moment. Jot that down. Good, excellent. Uh, some of you right now are becoming acutely aware of the fact that you are sitting in front of a webcam and you're nervous about where this might be leading. That's fine. Just let yourself immerse in that moment. Uh, and then last but not least, underneath your most embarrassing moment, Jot down your, good, so read. Uh, I appreciate you writing into the chat that you fell into a whiteboard while teaching about the Boston Tea Party. Read, you do not have to enter this information into the chat. You're just writing it down on a scratch piece of paper. Um, but I, I sure do appreciate reading about that. Last but not least, jot down the age you were when you received your first kiss. Um, don't worry, Reed, I'm reading. Uh, age you were when you received your first kiss. I had a guy ask me in a, in a session one time. He's like, you mean like the first kiss from my mom? No. No, I don't mean like the first kiss from your mom. The age you were when you received what you would potentially consider to be your first romantic kiss. Uh, so go ahead and jot that age down. And here's what I'd like you to do. Now go ahead and take that scratch piece of paper and fold it over one time, please. Take, take that scratch piece of paper, fold it over one time. Uh, look at it up in the light. Notice that you can see through it a little bit. So go ahead and take that scratch piece of paper and fold it over a second time. Fold it over a second time. And here's what I'd like you to do. On one side of this piece of paper, nice and big, uh, I want you to write your first name, nice and big. On one side of this sheet of paper, write your first name, nice and large. Notice I'm holding it up in front of my webcam so that you can see that's what you do. And then take that piece of paper, hold it up, and take a look at the second side. Notice that the second side is blank. Here's what I'd like you to do with the blank side. Take that word that I asked you. Take that word that I asked you to think about. The answer to your question, what is the thing in life that you value most? And I asked you to distill your answer down to one word. Go ahead and write that word on the other side of your piece of paper, please. Write that one word down on the other side. So on the front side, you have your name, and on the back side, you have the thing in life that you value most. 
And because we're not all together, uh, and because uh, I can't yet see what's going on on your webcam, do me a favor, type in the word into the chat that you wrote down for the thing in life that you value most. Go ahead and type it in. Type it in, the thing in life that you value most. Take a look at the chat. It's going crazy with the thing in life that people value most. Take a look at the answers that people are writing down. Things ranging from, oh, you can't see the chat. Uh, is there, Mike, is there any way to give them access to the chat so that they can see it? Good. Uh, can they see, I can see all your chats coming through. Uh, guys, let me know. Can you see the previous chat? Just give me a couple of you. Can you see the previous chat that happened before you got on? Good. No, you can't. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do one more time. It's going to look crazy. You'll get to see what it looks like on my end. Go ahead and type in, uh, type in one more time. What is the thing in life that you value most? Type in that single word so that you can see what everyone else wrote. Good. And no, enjoy this. This is what I see on my side, all 500 of you typing in the chat at the same time. Good. Type in that thing in life that you value most. Now I'm sure you can see it. Some of you are just having an absolute conniption about how crazy this is. Just relax, I got you, everything's fine. Um, notice the answers people wrote down. Start to scroll up. Look at the thing in life that people value most. And you know what I think is interesting? No matter where I do this activity, right? Doesn't matter if I do it in Connecticut, doesn't matter if I do it in Iowa, doesn't matter if I do it in East Los Angeles, doesn't matter if I do it in Honduras, does not matter if I do it in Italy. The number one, number one, most frequently given answer to the question of what is the thing in life that you value most is family. Almost always. Magda, is that what you wrote down as well? Very good. Thank you. Family. So, uh, Let's talk about that for just a moment. And let's talk about this piece of paper. Some of you, uh, let's talk about this for a second. Um, let's talk about trust. Let's talk about trust. Some of you got very, very nervous when I started asking some very, very easy, very rudimentary questions, uh, uh, personal questions about things like uh, your age and your weight. And some of you are holding onto this piece of paper and you're very nervous about what I'm going to ask you to do with it. Some of you are very nervous that there's about to be a webcam moment where I'm going to ask you to unfold it. That is not going to happen. That is not going to happen. Do not worry. Let's talk about trust for just a moment. And let's talk about how important trust is, uh, not just in the face-to-face -face environment, but especially in this environment. And let's talk about the trust that parents and the trust uh, that kids place in us every single day. And I want us to consider that every single day, this year and next year, because we're gonna spend a lot of time on this call looking at the future, let's talk about trust. Let's talk about the trust that parents and kids place on us every single day. Consider how massive trust is in our field and consider the fact that every single day, people walk in and they trust us with the thing in life that they value most. They trust us with their family. They trust us with their children. And I want us to feel the weight of that for just a moment, because some of us were feeling the weight of uh, trusting me with whatever you were going to do with some very minor personal information that shows up on that card. And I want, us, I want us to feel the weight of what we are asked to trust uh, and what we ask kids and parents to trust in us every single day. And so let's think about what our kids need to be able to trust as we move forward. Think about the time that we are going to spend, think about the time that we have spent with kids in both the synchronous and asynchronous remote learning spaces. And think about what kids need to be able to trust in us. Number one, right? Um, Elizabeth says we should be more mindful of our language when we talk about kids then, absolutely, right? So let's think about what kids need to be able to trust. Uh, kids need to be able to trust that our time that they spend with us has value. And so we need to think about how to be intentional as we move forward and recognize that we know that some of our kids have checked out. We know that some of our kids, when we offer opportunities to meet with them in a synchronous uh, virtual learning environment, they don't join. And where does that, we need to be, be honest with ourselves about where that tendency comes from. And we need to think about next year and start to think about, okay, kids need to be able to trust that the time spent with us has value. 
And so how do we make sure that these times are times when kids get the most bang for their buck? Here's what else kids need to be able to trust about us. They need to be able to trust that they, need, they can be successful in what we are asking them to do, right? And so I, I encouraged you in previous webinars to think about, hey, not just your high flyers, not just your kids who are at proficiency, but your struggling learners and start to ask yourself, like, are you aiming those activities at struggling learners? Because kids need to be successful and they need to be able to trust in that. Kids also need to be able to trust that we are competent and confident in this space. Now, we are learning the first one and ideally we are developing the second one and that is confidence, right? So we're developing competence in this space. Um, so do me a favor, uh, Mike, you can uh, uh, let the chat go so that uh, folks aren't uh, uh, distracted by it. We're gonna get back to it here momentarily. Uh, but kids need to know that we are competent and confident in this space. So some of us are struggling with the confidence piece and I want you to know that that's okay. That's completely okay if you're, if you're a person out there who's struggling with the confidence piece. Think about the first time you closed the door to your classroom, very first time as a classroom teacher. I can tell you, I can remember that moment very, very clearly. I remember the first time I closed my door as a classroom teacher, and I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, like people just left their children with me. Like I don't, I don't feel qualified for this at all. And some of us felt that. Some of us got to revisit that moment as we entered into the virtual learning space. Like, oh my gosh, like these kids are here with me and I have no idea how to make this work in this space. So recognize that that is a normal part of the process and we need to develop that confidence because kids need to trust that we are both competent and confident. And last but not least, kids need to trust that we are also willing to learn. They need to trust that we are willing to learn and that they need to trust that we understand the science of learning. And with that in mind, let's talk about the science of learning for just a moment. Let's talk about how do we teach? How do we coach? How do we lead? Regardless of what your role is uh, on this call, think about how do we teach? How do we coach? How do we lead? And I want us to all come from the same place. Uh, and that is this, if you don't know it, you can't grow it. And so if we're trying to teach, coach, and lead our kids into a place of remote learning competence, then we have to be coming from a place of remote learning competency. And in order to come from a place of remote learning competency, we have to understand the science of learning. And so let's understand the science of learning for just a moment. And here's, Paul says, uh, I felt that way the first time I chaperoned a field trip to DC. Yeah, Paul, I'm sure you felt like, oh my gosh, like these people have trusted me to take their kids to Washington, DC. Like, I hope nothing happens to them. I feel that, I feel that. Uh, let's, let's enter into the seventh inning stretch for just a moment. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to do it right along with you. If you choose not to do it, that's entirely your choice. Uh, know that you'll actually need what I'm about to give you for what happens next. Um, many of us have been sitting for a long time today. Here's what I'd like you to do. A uh, couple simple stretches. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Third one arm across your body. I'm going to ask you to stretch your elbows behind you and then fold your other arm across your body. So the first steps are fold, stretch, fold, right? Fold, stretch, fold. It is fold, stretch, fold. Let's do it one more time. Fold, stretch, fold, fold, stretch, fold. Here we go. Fold, stretch, and fold. Excellent. Shake it out. Second part of the stretch, really, really simple. You're going to twist to one side, and then you're going to twist to the other side in your chair, and then you're going to pull those arms above your head, right? So it's twist, twist, pull, right? First three are fold, stretch, fold followed by twist, twist, pull. Let's do the second part. It's twist, it's twist, and it's pull. Good, we're gonna put those two things together, right? So it's fold, stretch, fold, and it's twist, twist, pull. Fold, stretch, fold, twist, twist, pull. Good, and good. second part, twist, twist, pull. Let's start from the top, here we go. Let's fold, stretch, and fold, and then you're gonna twist, twist, and pull. Let's all do it one more time. Again, fold, stretch, fold, twist, twist, pull. Here we go. It is fold, stretch, fold. It is twist, twist, and pull. Excellent. Now, uh, great stretching. Uh, for those of you who did it, thanks. I really appreciate it. For those of you who didn't, I'll never know. And uh, how many of you all know we just learned something right there? So uh, uh, type it in the chat window if you have any idea what we might have just learned, right? You just learned something. Yes, we did some stretching. Uh, what did we just learn right there? Type it in the chat window. You just learned something actually really important and really valuable. Anyone know what it was? Good. Some of you saying modeling, uh, brain breaks, a sequence, engagement, 
good break time, release tension. Yeah, all of those things are important. All of those things are important in this space. Uh, good, following directions. Yes, all of those things are really important. How many of you also know that you just learned how to tie a really, really valuable knot? Uh, let, me, let me be more clear. Uh, each of you on this call just learned how to tie a figure eight loop. Every single one of you just learned how to tie a figure eight loop. Tying a figure eight loop is very simple. Guess what the steps are in tying a figure eight loop? It is fold, stretch, fold, twist, twist, pull. Those are the steps in tying a figure eight loop. Very, very simple. So if you have a charging cord that I asked you to get, here we go. I'll walk you through how to tie a figure eight loop. Very, very simple. Remember, fold, stretch, fold, twist, twist, pull. There's also a picture there in front of you. You can also watch me. Here we go. Step number one in tying a figure eight loop, you are going to fold just like this halfway, right? Step number one. Step number two is stretch. So you should have a cord that looks something like this. Next step is fold. This is where it gets a little tricky. You're going to take the top half of this and you're going to fold it over about halfway, right? Fold, stretch, fold. I'll go through that one more time. Very, very simple. Starting straight. Step number one is fold, followed by stretch, and then fold. You're going to fold halfway. After that, inch your hand up right here so that you're holding on to this and this loop. And what comes next is twist, followed by twist. And see this bottom loop right here? You're going to press this bottom loop through the top one and pull. And what you get there at the end is a very nice, very sound, very valuable figure eight loop right? Super important little knot, really, really strong knot uh, that you can tie anytime, right? Fold, stretch, fold, twist, twist, pull. Fold, stretch, fold, twist, twist, pull. I'll demo it one more time. Here we go. Ready? Fold, stretch, and fold. This is probably the point where some of you got a little confused. You're going to eke your hand all the way up here, hold on to both sides, and at the top, you're going to twist twist, and then you're going to pull this bottom loop through the top loop, right? And what you get is a very nice, very clean figure eight loop. Magda, very, very well done. Mike, very well done. Fold, stretch, fold, twist, twist, pull. Okay, great, right? Good. Beth, I love that you're uh, uh, keying into modalities, right? So auditory, visual, kinesthetic. Remember some of the stuff that we talked about on one of our last calls? calls it's about getting kids doing stuff. I, I can't control whether you authentically work with me or not, but what I can control is offering the opportunity for you to engage with me in some sort of substantive way. Now, why the heck did I just teach you how to tie a figure eight loop knot? Because we have to dissect the science of learning for just a moment. So let's think about learning. Let's think about learning. Let's think about us as learners, and let's think about our kids as learners. Anytime anyone learns anything, there are two things that we have to consider. So all of my math teachers uh, and hopefully all of my at one time math students are looking at these two symbols right now. And somebody type into the chat window, let me know what you see here when you see these two symbols. What do you see? Good, good, good. Yes, greater than and less than. Good, thank you for those of you who are typing it in. What you see right here is greater than and less than. And so when we think about learning, whether it's our own professional learning or learning that happens with kids, we have to consider a couple of things, right? We have to consider first and foremost, the perceived level of difficulty of a task. And we also have to consider a person's willingness to risk. So whenever ki kids learn anything and whenever adults learn anything, there are two things to consider. One is the perceived level of difficulty. The other is a person's willingness to risk. And here's what we know to be true. When a person's perceived level of difficulty of a task is great, guess what? Their willingness to participate is low. What we also know is that when the perceived level of difficulty of a task is less, their willingness to participate is great. And so think about the knot tying activity. Think about the knot tying activity. Think about how I started teaching you how to tie a figure eight loop knot. Think about how that activity is different if I begin by saying, all right, welcome. Great to have you guys here in the webinar. I'm gonna teach you how to tie a figure eight loop. Be real honest about what goes on in the back of your head if that's how I start that moment. In the minute that I start that moment with, hey, I'm gonna teach you how to tie a figure eight loop, 
we get a lot of voices going on inside of our head. And if you're sitting there thinking right now, like, oh, I don't have voices inside my head. Yeah, that voice that just, that just said that, that's the voice inside your head, right? We have that voice inside our head that says in that moment, the minute I lead with, hey, I'm gonna teach you how to tie a figure eight loop, you get that voice that says, eh, I'm either not interested in this or this sounds too difficult. And so I am escaping this task. Rule, I saw what you just posted there, absolutely. That's what our voice tells us. Yeah, this sounds difficult, I'm out. And so we have to think about how we approach learning with our kids, because I'll tell you what, this is the place where resistance lives. Resistance lives in the place where kids determine that the perceived level of difficulty of a task is so great that they are now unwillingness to participate. And what we know to be true is that this is where learning lives. Learning lives in the place where the perceived level of difficulty of a task is low, and as such, a person's willingness to participate is high. That is true for children, and it is true for adults. Let's think about ourselves here for just a moment. Our kids are going to be leaving us uh, in a short while, so let's think about our own learning, because we're going to have some learning that's going to need to take place before the course of next, uh, next school year. Let's think about our own learning and ask ourselves, how do we live in this place? Let's think about professional learning for just a moment. Because you can't separate masterful coaching and masterful teaching in any way, shape, or form. So many of you recognize this, right? I do, we do, you do. Type into the chat. Somebody tell me what this is called. It's been around forever. This idea, I do, we do, you do. I'm sure almost all of you have heard this before. Anyone know what it's called? Very good, very good. Lots of you typing in right now. Gradual release model, gradual release of responsibility. Excellent, excellent. Bonus for all of you. Uh, 1,000 points for everyone who just guessed gradual release model. Nicely done. It's like, whose line is it anyway? I'm afraid the points don't matter, right? I do, we do, you do. Gradual release model. Now, let's think about our own professional learning. Let's think about professional learning and how it oftentimes shows up. Oftentimes, there's a person who shows up to offer up some professional learning, and I demonstrate a skill, right? I demonstrate how to do reciprocal teaching in a remote learning platform, or I demonstrate how to do Socratic seminar in a remote learning platform, or I demonstrate how to do gradual release model in a remote learning platform. And then all of a sudden, there's an expectation that you as teachers now go take that and replicate it in a remote learning environment. And it's so funny because then many of us wonder like, man, I wonder why more of these skills and strategies aren't making their way into the classroom. I wonder why, man, like we just went to a webinar with Weston, he showed us how to do a thing, and now my expectation is that I go and do that thing in a virtual environment with 30 potentially hostile participants, best of luck. And what we need to understand is that there is a missing piece of the professional development puzzle. There is a missing piece. There is a thing that as teachers, we almost never get the time to do, and that is this one right here. We don't get the opportunity to practice. We don't get the opportunity in small groups to practice with one another, to practice the skills that we're gonna need before we actually bring them in front of kids. It's game day every day for us. So oftentimes we learn a skill and then we gotta go try it with kids. And guess what, there's a lot of reluctance around that, why? Perceived level of difficulty is high and as such people's willingness to participate is low. And so the challenge for us moving forward is to think about where do we find opportunities to practice? And that lives in micro-teaching. Tell me right now, yes or no, if you would be comfortable jumping on, uh, do me a favor, Michael, will you turn on the chat so everyone can see it real quick? Tell me right now, yes or no, if you would be comfortable jumping on your camera and giving everyone in this platform, all 500 of us, <laughs> Caitlin wrote no already, she doesn't know what the question is, uh, giving all of us an explanation of what micro-teaching is, right? Who would feel comfortable jumping, and telling, uh, uh, jumping on and telling us what micro-teaching is? <laughs> I, I see almost entirely no's. <laughs> Dwight says, if I knew I would. Damien says, once I Google it, I'm getting a lot of thumbs down, no's, and a couple like uh, maybes. All right, hey, know that your responses, <laughs> Stephen says, teaching small people. I really like that, Stephen. Just, just for the record, good. Mike, Mike, turn that chat off for just a moment, please. Um, uh, so almost overwhelmingly, the, the answer is no. And know that your, your response is really common. I'll tell you, teachers across the country overwhelmingly cannot explain to me what micro-teaching is. Uh, and here's why that matters. Here's what we know to be true. Micro-teaching has an effect size of nearly nine-tenths. What does that mean? 
when children have teachers who participate in micro-teaching, we know that typically kids will grow more than two academic years over a single year's worth of time when kids have teachers who participate regularly in micro-teaching. Now, here's what micro-teaching is. Don't worry, I won't make you do this. Micro-teaching is the we do. It's organized practice teaching. The goal is to give the teachers confidence and support and feedback by letting us try out a small slice of what we plan to do with kids in a safe environment. And ideally, oh, here's where some of you are gonna really tighten up on me. These micro-teaching sessions are videotaped, right? Uh, for uh, uh, review individually with an experienced teaching consultant, peer, partner, uh, that's what micro-teaching is. And these are not my words. This is out of the Derek Fox Center for Teaching and Learning uh, out of Harvard University, fairly reputable institution at last check. Uh, they also included here at the bottom, micro-teaching is a quick, efficient, proven, and fun. I think they're playing fast and loose with that word fun right there, quite frankly. I think they've forgotten at Harvard what fun means. Uh, way to get off to a strong start. So let's talk about micro-teaching uh, for just a moment. And Charles says he did one during his graduate special ed course. Charles, hold on to that. I'm going to come back to that for in, in just a second. Let's talk about micro-teaching. Let's talk about the idea of practice, and let's talk about the idea of filming those sessions to talk about. Before we do, I wanna know, does anyone know who this person is? Type in the chat if you know who this person is. If you don't, not a big deal. Anyone know who this is? I'm curious, just, just a quick trivia question. Oh, Rob, you are an immediate winner. Most of you are saying Paul, uh, uh, no, most of you are, are saying this is Tom Landry. Um, if you're saying Tom Landry or Bear Bryant, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Christina says Kevin Costner. Christina, really great guess. Not sure where you got that from, but I love it. Um, I'll tell you what, uh, where, are you, where are you, Rob? Uh, uh, Rob, and, uh, Rob Smirnoff and Richard Cordaway both said it. They were the first two people to respond. That is Paul Brown, right? If you said Paul Brown, congratulations, you are correct, Stephen, not Liam Neeson. Uh, if you don't know who Paul Brown is, uh, here's uh, another quick hint. He was the original coach of the Cleveland Browns. The team is named after him. The Cleveland Browns are called the Cleveland Browns, not because their helmet is orange. Uh, it's because their original coach, Paul Brown, uh, the team is named after him. Uh, now, if you don't know who Paul Brown is, if you don't know anything about football, it doesn't matter. Uh, here's all we need to know about Paul Brown. Here's why I want to talk about him. Um, Paul Brown invented the draw play. If you don't know what the draw play is, doesn't matter. Know that every high school, college, and uh, NFL team uses it. They run the draw play. Uh, Paul Brown was also the first person after the introduction of the hard helmet to say, hey, you guys know what's awesome? Teeth. We should put a face mask on these helmets. Like that was Paul Brown's idea. Paul Brown was also the, uh, the first person to say, hey, you know what would be great is if not just all the coaches knew the plays, it would be amazing if all the players knew the plays as well. He was the first one to distribute offensive and defensive playbooks to his team. And Paul Brown was one of the first uh, coaches in the NFL to help break the color barrier, first coach in the NFL to draft uh, black players into the NFL, right? All of these are great things, but they're not why I want to talk about Paul Brown. Paul Brown was a pioneer of this movement right here. Paul Brown was the pioneer of film study. Uh, now, <laughs> Lee said in the chat, the Browns stink. That's all people need to know. Lee, as a Broncos fan, I agree. Don't you dare talk about my Broncos. Let me head that off at the pass. Um, so let's talk about uh, uh, Paul Brown and, and watching film. First of all, think about it. How many NFL teams watch film? All of them. Uh, how many college teams watch film? All of them. Uh, how many high school teams watch film? All of them, even the bad ones, right? I say that as a, as a person who coaches high school football, even the bad ones watch film. Everyone watches film. Why, enter into the chat, why do players watch film? Why do players watch film? Enter in the, into the chat. It doesn't even need to be football players. Think about football, think about basketball, think about gymnastics, golf. Uh, think about people who rehearse for a uh, musical or uh, stage performances, right? Right, to see how to improve. I'm reading through to reflect on their performance, to improve performance, to improve, to evaluate their performance, to improve, to reflect. Excellent. All of these are accurate answers. So think about this. 
Um, enter into the chat and do me a favor, Mike, will you make the chat visible for everyone? Enter into, so think about it. Think about how many times, and if you have to guess, it's all right. How many times have you as a classroom teacher in either a remote learning space or face-to-face or, or -face, watched yourself on film teach a lesson? Type that number into the chat window, please. The number of times you've watched yourselves, yourself on film teach a lesson. I see five, I see 10, four, five, two to three, four, three, zero, lots of zeros, eight, very good, 10, six plus, three or four, zero, 10, 20, great, good, a couple. Uh, overwhelmingly, the numbers are, are relatively low. Uh, here's something I want you to consider. Okay, every high school player watches film. On average, there are 10 high school football games in a given football season, which means if you only play football once, chances are you'll watch yourself at least 10 times on film. What does that mean? That means your average high school football player has watched themselves do what they do on film more than your average teacher has watched themselves teach, and it's not even close. And I will tell you, one of those things is way more important than the other. Spoiler alert, it is not football. And I say that as a fan, I say that as a coach. It is absolutely insane to me that more high school boys have watched themselves on film than teachers have watched themselves teach, and it's not even close. Good. Uh, Mike, we turn off the chat for just a moment, please? So let's talk about the why behind why that is, and let's be real honest about it. Uh, if I were to ask you all right now why that is, why high school teachers, uh, middle school, elementary teachers have not watched themselves teach on film, uh, let me dispel this notion of time for just a moment. Nobody is asking you to watch yourself teach an entire 45 minute, 50 lesson. Oh, who has time for that? I'm talking like putting your camera up, filming yourself, do two minutes of what you do, and then watching it in a closet somewhere by yourself. If you ask the, yourself the question, like, why don't we do that very often? I think you'll find that the answer has very little to do with value and a whole lot to do with vanity because it feels gross, right? Sa Sandra, I see you. You said fear. It feels gross. Because you'll watch the video and you'll watch the exact same things I do. You'll say things like, does my voice really sound like that? Yes, that's what we hear when we hear your voice. Or you'll watch things and you'll be like, man, do I really look like that in that shirt? Yes, that's exactly what we see when you wear that shirt. We don't do this very often because the vanity of the moment overwhelms the value of the moment. And that's a terrible reason not to do a thing that we know authentically helps children. That has an effect size of point. Eight, eight. It has too much value for us to dismiss it because of the vanity. And so it's going to be a place I encourage you as we move into next school year, it's a place that costs us nothing. It costs us nothing in terms of investment in money and or very much time for us to film two, three, four minutes of us doing what we do and watch it back. I'll tell you this, before I go and do something like this or before I keynote uh, uh, to a large audience, I will tell you, I 100% have to film myself doing what I do. I'll give you a quick story. Quick story. Uh, one of the first times I watched myself on film doing what I do, I made two mistakes. Number one, uh, after I was done uh, uh, making the film, I plugged it into my TV. Mistake number one, it does not need to be larger or louder. Uh, mistake number two, as I was about to hit play on the video, my wife walked in and she asked me what I was doing. And I said, hey, I'm about to watch this video of myself uh, speaking in front of a small group. Uh, so I can find ways to get better. And she asked me if she could watch, and I said yes. That was mistake number two. I turned on the video. 30 seconds into the video, uh, I leaned forward, and I was like, huh, why am I doing that thing with my hands? And I said that to my wife, and she looked at me, and she was like, oh, you always do that thing with your hands. And I looked at her, and I said, no, I don't. And she said, watch. I guarantee you do it the whole video. And sure enough, I watched, and I didn't realize that early in my career as a speaker, I was always really nervous about big hand gestures. And so I didn't realize that early in my career, I would do a lot of speaking and all of my hand gestures occurred from this like teeny tiny little T-Rex alligator arms placed from right here in front of my body. And what was even worse was that after I was done using my hands to talk, I would just let them like hang, like all flaccid like here in the front of my body. It was awful. It was terrible. It was uncomfortable. It was fearful. And I'll tell you what, I learned in 30 seconds something I could improve about myself that made me better on behalf of the kids and the teachers that I serve.
We have to overcome the fear and the vanity of the moment to make sure that we extract the value. And I'll tell you, as we start to think about how we move forward, this is going to be a place that I consistently encourage you to learn and grow and learn and grow and learn and grow. Micro teaching is a thing that teachers have to be doing. Think about all the time we waste uh, during staff meetings or department meetings or PLC meetings talking about things that we can't change. Talking about kids and what happens at, at home and behaviors that we're unlikely to change. Think about what we could do if we started for, to prioritize small group practice teaching, if we prioritize opportunities for us to videotape short slices of what we do and then watch them to self-assess and for peer assessment, think about the impact that that could have on kids in a very short amount of time. And know that it's gonna be a place that I continue to push us again and again and again and again. Because if we think authentically about how learning works, we know that that's a place where we can be great for kids. Now, also know that I'm very cognizant of this right here perceived level of difficulty, and willingness to risk. For some of you right now, uh, the perceived level of difficulty that you're having around thinking about micro-teaching, filming yourself, and potentially showing that film to another person is great, and so resistance is great, and your willingness to risk is very low. But I wanna push us towards this place right here. I wanna push us towards the place where learning lives, where number one, we agree this is worth our effort. Number two, we think about and this is what I want you to do. This is your takeaway before we wrap up our time today. I want you to think about a strategy for next year. Not the thing that you're already awesome at. I want you to think about a strategy for next year in a place you want to get better. Do you want to get better at feedback on behalf of kids? Do you want to get better at vocabulary strategies? Do you want to get better at authentic, rigorous, and relevant questioning? Do you want to get better at problem-solving teaching? Think about a strategy that you want to get better at for next year. And think about over the course of the next several months, where there are opportunities to film yourself, because I know many of you are going to be filming content over the summer or leading into the school year that you're gonna use throughout the course of the year. I want you to think about where that shows up for you and where opportunities to solo watch that video show up for you, recognizing that ideally the place where this goes is a place to where we film and we coach and partner watch, because I'll tell you, it's the only way. It's the only way that I've seen schools, teachers, entire districts grow over time. And I'll, I'll leave you with this before I, I answer any final questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, or heart palpitations. Uh, I'll tell you this. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I got a call from an associate superintendent in Kalinga Huron, California. Kalinga Huron is the poorest district in the entire state of California, by far. Median household income in Kalinga Huron, Kalinga Huron is in the Central Valley of California. It's typically where most of the food west of the Mississippi is grown. Median household income in Kalinga Huron is $20,000 a year. Household in California. And I got a call from their superintendent uh, there at the time who said, hey, Weston, I'm new to the superintendency. Uh, the outgoing superintendent bought uh, literally thousands of MacBooks for all of our students, and they've been sitting in storage for the last six months because we don't know how to roll them out. Guys, this was a place where uh, kids did not have Wi-Fi access at home. Uh, there was no Wi-Fi access in the schools. There was one place in the entire town where you could get Wi-Fi. And if you're thinking Starbucks, remember, median household income, $20,000 a year, it was at McDonald's. McDonald's was the only place where you could get Wi-Fi. And he said, hey, I want to make sure that our kids don't have fewer opportunities than do the kids north of us in Palo Alto. He said, we need to roll out these devices, we need to equip our schools with Wi-Fi, and we need to make sure that our teachers are prepared for this movement to future-focused instruction. And so I was in Kalinga Huron for three years. I was in Kalinga Huron for three years. I would fly out and I would work with teachers and we'd prep over and over and over. And guess what we did over the course of those three years? Micro-teaching. Small group practice teaching. Go when baseball starts back up, show up to a baseball game, three, the three hours before the game, what will you see players doing? Practicing. They do it every day, right? People who have reached the pinnacle of their profession. And that's all we did in Kalinga Huron. We practice, practice, practice. The implementation of highly effective instructional strategies in conjunction with digital tools. And guess what? That was a district that went from uh, uh, over the course of three years from not being able to get Wi-Fi in the schools to being recognized as one of the top 10 in the nation for their work in blended learning by the Learning Council. Guys, that has nothing to do with me. 
right? And it has everything to do with the application of a high yield strategy over time, micro teaching. 0.88, practice, 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 practice. It's the only way that I know to authentically and systemically get better on behalf of kids. Let me take a deep breath in and let it out. I'll invite you to do the same. And uh, at this time, if anyone has any questions, comments, concerns, Magda, if you have anything that you want me to address, anything that came up for you, I will pause. I will take a drink of my coffee and uh, we'll, we'll wrap up here in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Thank you so much, Weston. This was really, again, informative and helpful. And um, for those of us who did not know what micro teaching was, it's another thing for us to be thinking about. Um, but considering that, I think that sometimes or often, especially in this space, what we're grappling with is um, the full plate, right? Like, so this is quite the um, task for us to really look at to improve and enhance our task. But, you know, we're doing that and juggling um, what new curriculum will be. So what are your thoughts about that in terms of how do districts at this time um, strategically pare down and really have a clearer focus? So we have to weed the garden a lot. Magda, like what you're saying is really important and it's a thing that I've been encouraging superintendents and building leaders uh, to do a lot is to weed the garden and say like, okay, where do I spend time in the, in the course of a given day uh, or in the course of a month or a year uh, doing things that don't benefit children. And we do a lot of them. We, uh, you know, I referenced earlier, like think about the amount of time uh, that is taken up in staff meetings and department meetings, disseminating information that could just as easily be disseminated via email. We got to take a look really, really hard at where those moments are and weed the garden a little bit so that we can find times for authentic micro teaching to take place. And keep in mind, I am not talking about watching, like I would never go back and watch this full webinar again. Like I, like I, I was here, I was part of it, but I, would, I will go back and watch three, four, five minutes of it because I know it's a thing I can do to, to get better. And when we're talking about investments of time, micro teaching doesn't have to be a huge investment of time. It can be, hey, go watch between three and five minutes of what you do think about like, hey, where can I show up? Where can I get better? If you've got a self-assessment tool that you want to fill out, that's fine. Like uh, all of these things, we're talking about micro investments of time here, not massive investments. Thank you. I think that's kind of where we are. Um, and, and how do you, I guess, and, and then I guess to pig, piggyback on that, coaching in this space, right? Like you talked about the gradual release. So what does coaching look like in this space as everyone is building confidence and confidence, but still it doesn't minimize the need for coaching and things we may have needed coaching in before we got into this space. Like what do you recommend in terms of that kind of um, experience for teachers? So, so coaching is critical. Coaching can't be the thing that we think about doing. It has to be the thing that we are always doing. There were two different studies done, one done in 1984 and replicated again in 2003. And these studies both found that when teachers are simply exposed to a new skill, typically only about 10% of us can replicate what we've seen. However, when teachers are coached through the awkward phase of implementation, that's the exact wording from the study, more than 95% can replicate the skill. Guys, coaching can't be the thing we think about doing. It has to be the thing that we are always doing. And that doesn't just have to come from our instructional leaders and our formal coaches. If you know a colleague who is proficient in a skill that you would like to improve in, your challenge is to seek out informal coaching from that person. If you are good at a thing that you know can help children, your challenge is to offer it up, not close your doors and hoard it for yourself, but offer it up to those who need to see what it looks like, sounds like, and feels like to get better. Coaching has to be a thing that we are always doing. If you look at people who have reached the pinnacle on whatever field that they are in, 99% of the time, they have coaches and mentorship that accompanies that journey. So I do see some questions in the um, coming up in the chat. Mike, do you want to um, share some of the questions that our participants have? I can, I can check. So Buster's, Buster's got a, 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 a good a couple of questions here, right? So uh, he asked, what tech do you recommend we use for recording, sharing, and reviewing teaching? So it, it depends entirely on what format we're in. In a virtual format, uh, I love, uh, and I've talked about this before, use the format we're in right now. Hop on a Zoom, throw on your webcam. Yes, scary, I know, right? And do a screencast where you just capture 
five minutes of you in a synchronous session just doing what you do. Just hit the screen caps button, let it run, teach your kids as you normally would, and it will capture for you five minutes of you doing what you do. It takes no effort on your part other than to click the button to start the screencast at the start of your time together. I would use that. If you are face-to-face -face with kids, take this thing, post it up in the back of your room, turn it on for two or three minutes, film yourself doing what you do, and then take it, close yourself in a closet, turn the volume all the way down to low, and watch it, and then when it's done, delete it from your phone, delete it from the cloud so it never exists again, uh, and you don't have to think about it or worry about it. It, it doesn't have to, we don't have to approach micro-teaching with a formality. Uh, it can be something that we informally do when we set goals to do for ourselves uh, every week, every couple of weeks. Set a once a month goal to say, hey, okay, this month, like, I got to find three minutes to, to watch myself do what I do. It, it, it doesn't need to be formal. Uh, Michelle asked, could you please send the source of the professional learning study and percentage of teachers application? Yes, I absolutely will. Magda, will you remind me of that? Uh, I will send the source of both of those studies. Great question, Michelle. A source of studies, okay. Yeah, Judy said, I actually do a daily video for my kids since this distance learning started. Judy, such a great point. Many of us are, like the gift that distance learning gives us is many of us now have these videos. It's not a thing that we have to create. Many of us have them. Go back, go back and watch a couple of minutes of them. Challenge, uh, challenge yourself to ask some of your peers, people who you respect uh, in their role as educators to say, hey, like, will you do me a favor? We just watch three minutes of this and give me some honest feedback about how I can get better. And if you are a person who is being asked to do that, please, on behalf of your peers, recognize that going back to that person and saying, I thought it was great, gives them zero help or support. <laughs> zero, right? Challenge yourself to be better on their behalf to give them some authentic, uh, authentic feedback and challenge yourself as an educator to come from a place where you can hear it and use it to improve. Yeah, Marta, Mar Marta brings up a good point here that, I, that I, I do wanna talk about. Marta says, I do watch and redo if needed. So Marta, that's great. I do wanna just offer a word of caution there because some of us will get caught up in this sort of like loop of like, okay, I recorded a thing, now I'm gonna watch it, and it's like, Ugh, I don't like it, and they'll re-record, re-record, re-record. So like, make sure you don't cross over into this sort of like OCD realm of like, I'm gonna record a thing and I wanna make sure it's perfect before it goes out to kids, because uh, that's time you don't have. That's time you don't have. Be okay for it to just be what it's gonna be and for your growth to occur organically over time. Your, grow your growth doesn't have, have to happen all for the same video. April's April says, I noticed that I make quite a few faces, also that I can make a big difference with just the tone of my voice. Yes. So April, I love that you're thinking about this because in the virtual space, things like tone, things like hand movement, things like eye contact, looking down the barrel of the camera versus looking off to the side, like those things, are, those things have a different impact in the virtual space. Recognizing that and using those things as tools in your toolbox helps us get better. Those are good questions from our educators. Yeah, uh, uh, Alicia, it looks like you said we have to make sure that teachers have a specific strategy that they want to be discussed. Yes, 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 right? Make sure that we're not talking. So if you're going to go to a teacher, say like, hey, I'm going to use Flipgrid with my kids. Like, let me know how I use Flipgrid. That's not, that's not the area where we want to micro-teach. We don't want to micro-teach around tools. We want to micro-teach around strategy because strategy is what we know authentically moves the needle for kids. Oh, your comments are so awesome, you guys. Um, and Weston, I guess, just based on uh, kind of going back to a couple of sessions where you were talking about um, tools versus skills and strategies, uh -huh. do you have a recommendation for districts in terms of the number of tools that people can be provided? Here, let us help you. Here are 20 tools. Like, is there a recommended, or, you know, not that you would advocate for a particular tool, but just so that we don't fall victim to just thinking, throwing things at people that you know, aren't necessarily useful or are too much. Yeah, Magda, that's an awesome question. So it's a, it's a request that I get from teachers all the time, which is like, hey, what's your top 10, top 20 tools that you really like? And I am always so reluctant to provide people with that list because it's overwhelming. Right. It's really overwhelming. Uh, I will tell you this, I like, it's my job to know a lot of the digital tools that are out there. And there's a lot of them that I don't feel proficient in. I'll tell you a huge one. So like 
Pear Deck is not a tool that I use with any frequency whatsoever. Because I, I, I started by using Nearpod. And for me, like Nearpod and Pear Deck have such similar functionality that I, I'm going to lean into this one. So, so start to look at tools and sort of filter them through a lens of like, what do these tools do? And don't paint yourself into the corner of learning multiple tools that essentially do the same thing. So right. another perfect example, like Pull Everywhere and Mentimeter, right? They do almost identical things. Don't learn both of those. Don't waste your time with that. Learn one of those. I, I use Mentimeter. Why? Because it's free and you can have a, a maximum number of people on it. It doesn't even matter, right? So I like Mentimeter for that. Uh, I'll tell you what, Edpuzzle is a tool that I use all the time because there's not a lot of other tools like Edpuzzle that I really like that are that educator friendly. Like that's one that I like. So be, be really wary of asking uh, uh, for things like that because be careful what you wish for. The minute you ask for 20 tools, you're going to go down a rabbit hole of exploring 20 tools. And again, you don't have time for that. Figure out what strategies you're best at and now start to do the work of asking people like, hey, I am really awesome at explicit direct instruction and what digital tools support explicit direct instruction. I'm really awesome at this vocabulary strategy. What tools that are out there that support this vocabulary strategy? Those are the questions we need to ask. That's very helpful because yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm nervous about as we move forward and have the, you know, the likelihood that this is how we'll be, that it, we become bombarded with tools and not really thinking about usefulness or we have needless duplication, duplication of tools. So Absolutely. And Corey, and Corey nailed it right here in the comments. Too much information, expectations, tools, and resources are counterproductive. Corey, you're exactly right. right. Corey, you're exactly right. We don't want to, we don't want to arrive at a place and this was a really common thing that happened when the pandemic first hit. We all went into quarantine and everyone went home. If you were looking on social media, everyone's response was like, oh, let's just throw tools at this problem. Uh, and that's not going to make us better for kids. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we have any more comments from our chat box? Any I, more questions? I tried to respond to as many uh, a, a, as I could. Hey, thank you guys so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. I, I appreciate all of your comments and uh, the engagement and the, and the interaction within the chat. Uh, I love it so much. It, it, I'll tell you what, uh, for a group of 500, uh, you make this really, really easy for me. So I'm so grateful. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, uh, I so much. I really appreciate you. Thank you. All right, be well, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye, Middletown.